You're watching Go Live On Demand with Pastor Smokey Norfolk in Victory Cathedral Worship Center. Your hope, healing, and empowerment starts now. Amen. Grab your Bibles. Hebrews, the second, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 2. 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Those of you who are joining us around the globe, I hope you had a good time in the praise party because we really were praising for you too. Thank you so much for praising with us. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. I'm not going to keep you long today. I know it's, it's hot outside and y'all can't wait to get in the sunshine. Hebrews, actually, it's not hot today. We live in Chicago. That's all I can say. 90 plus degrees yesterday and 70 something today. God help us. Hebrews, the 20th, 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Wherever you are around the globe, we're experiencing some really interesting dynamics in our weather. 94 yesterday, was it? 97? The devil was here. Ain't nobody told me nothing. That's why I stayed in the house. He wasn't going to get with me. And then 70 something today, God help us. Lord help us. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. If you found us, amen. I'm going to read to you aloud from the New Living Translation as you read along with me silently. If you pray, I'll preach. I'm going to say it one more time. If you pray, then I'll preach. That's what I need. The prayers of the righteous availeth much. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance. Somebody say endurance. Let us run with endurance. Endurance. The only reason that you would have to have endurance is that there was resistance. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if something is opposing you, then you have to endure through the press or the process. So he's saying, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us, which gives us clear indication that it's not going to be easy. Some people have this ideology that is completely fallible, which believes that because you are a believer, because you're saved, because you're in church, that it's going to be easy. But life is hard. Anybody know life is hard? You've been through enough that you know life is hard. There are some ups and downs, some good, some bad. There are some moments where you have to endure. You've got to press through the process. Look at verse 2. We do this. This is how we do it. We do this by keeping our eyes on who? How do we learn from whom? Keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's how we endure. As we keep our eyes on Jesus, which means to learn of him. Study the example that he gave us. And we, know, we do this because he is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. The champion who initiates. Champion means what? A winner. A champion is the one that what? He wins or he has won. So we study the winner. Because he initiates and perfects our faith. And because of the joy. Somebody say because of the joy awaiting him. This is why he was able to endure. He endured the cross. Disregarding its shame. Because of the joy that was awaiting him. He endured the cross disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. God, give me grace to preach in this place. You set this up. You sent us here. I thank you for already letting us have a good time just praising you. Just celebrating who you are and thanking you that you are God. That even in our bad times can make a way out of no way. We bless you. We honor you. And we ask now that your presence would be here. That your glory would be revealed. And that ultimately I need an anointing that makes me able to preach with effectiveness and power. And I need another anointing in the house that makes people able to hear. That there be no hindrances, no obstacles, no phone calls, no text messages that prevent us from getting what you have for us to get. Thank you that it's going to change our life by changing our mind. Not just now, but eternally. In Jesus' name, we declare victory and say, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our awesome God. To God be the glory. Turn to somebody on the other side of you and say, It's going to be all right. Yeah, what you worried about? Why are you sweating the small stuff? It's going to be all right. 
Listen, there are a series, there's a series that I began last week, and we started by talking about the short stories with big messages, and we figured out last week that that's just commercials. That commercials are short stories, they're short mini movie, miniature movies within the movie, which is a feature presentation that simply give us a message within 30 to 60 seconds. And there's some big messages in these little things. They, they do a great job at masterfully orchestrating and depicting and putting in pictorial form as well as audio form that, that which we can take from, glean from, learn from. But of course, we know their motivation is to move us towards a product, towards their intended end. However, I'm going to flip the script on the enemy and I'm going to take it back and I'm going to utilize the things of the world, the vices of the world, the wealth of the world is laid up for the right us. There are things in the world that we need to take back because they belong to us. Creativity is one of them. Come on, somebody. It is God who is the ultimate creator. He created us. We are fearfully and wonderfully fashioned and created. He made us so intricate that doctors are still studying and practicing medicine to get it right. Come on, somebody. You've got a creative God who makes creative people. And creative people know how to make things happen and make things work when nobody else can figure out how to work it. Do I have any creative people in here today? We are creative people. Come on. Anybody know anything about the tinfoil on the end of the rabbit ears? Yeah, we are creative people. Hangers, come on, somebody. Put a little water in the ketchup, shake it up, and it lasts you a little bit longer. You put a rag in the stopper and make it in the dish in the sink and make it a stopper. Don't y'all act like we haven't had to be creative. Pork and bean and weenie and ramen noodle nights, but it tastes like steak with sauce on it. Creative people, creative people. So we're going to do some creative technology or some creative dynamics in order to better understand the word of God on today. As a matter of fact, watch the one from this week. Here we go. I'm your tailgate grill. Your buddy was in such a rush to get into the game, he didn't quite put me out. I see you bought the industrial sized bottle of lighter fluid. Smart. And if you got cut rate insurance, you could be paying for this yourself. So get an Allstate agent and be better protected from mayhem. Like me. Mayhem is everywhere. Are you in good hands? <laughs> Anybody seen these mayhem commercials? This brother here has been through so much stuff and wreak so much havoc on so many people. I, it was so many of them that I wanted to show you today. There was one where he was standing up on top of the car with a fire hose and he was spraying water inside the car saying, mayhem is everywhere. Are you protected? So I want to make sure that you understand that even in your life, mayhem is everywhere. And I want to know, are you protected? Everybody will have a bad day. I don't care who you are, I don't care how saved, sanctified, fine, baptized, oh, filled with the Holy Ghost you are. You too will have a bad day. The preacher has a bad day. Come on, somebody. The ushers and greeters have bad days. Parking and security have bad days. Members, parishioners, believers, we all, and, non, and those non-believers alike, we all have what? We have some bad days. Some of y'all having a bad day right now. It's written all over your face. You look like you've been sucking on a lemon for the last hour. It's evident you're having a bad day. So I want to help you today deal with the mayhem of your bad day. I want to help you to deal with the reality that you have an enemy that does not want you to have any good days. If it was his choice and if it was his direction and will, if ultimately it was his decision, you wouldn't have any good days. Because you have an enemy of your soul who comes to steal kill and destroy that's joy peace happiness and any other thing that god has graced us to have the enemy does not want us to have it because it might mean we'll get a we'll not have a bad day but we'll have a great day he roams throughout the land seeking whom he may devour the devil does everything that he can to derail our joy to steal our potential to take and distract our attention and our focus off of the faith that we have the confidence that we exhibit in an awesome god and he wants us to have perpetually bad days. So the truth is, the Bible says in this life, you shall have tribulation. Which gives me clear indication that I don't care who you are, eventually you will have a bad day. It's coming. 
And as my grandmother would say, if you haven't had one yet, just keep breathing. Keep a living because it's going to show up at your doorstep. You will have a bad day. So my responsibility today, my hope, my joy is to make sure that I equip us so that when bad days come, we're able to handle them in the same manner as Jesus and ultimately walk away as champions or victors over the day. You cannot let the bad day ruin your potential. A bad day can't take your joy. This is what the old people used to say. They say, this joy I have. The world didn't give it to me, so what? Oh, y'all got the same grandmama I see. The world can't take it away. It's internal, it's intrinsic, it's something that comes from within, not from without. Doesn't matter that what, what comes upon me because I figured out that greater is he that is in me than anything that the enemy or the world puts upon me. And when you know that, when you have that, when you understand it, when you are able to navigate the text and gain a wisdom that goes beyond your natural capacity and allow the Lord himself to begin to minister and to train and direct and teach you, you then will realize that even a bad day can't steal my joy. You ever seen people that they're happy? I don't care what's going on. They're always smiling. They always seem to manage to find the positive, even in the midst of the negative. And don't they get on your nerves? Come on, let's be honest. You're like, you're always happy. Good morning. How are you? It's not a good morning. Stop being so happy. We do that because misery loves what? I want you to be miserable because I'm miserable. But what they figured out is they tapped into something that we all as believers need to tap into. When God has invested his goodness on the inside, he has hidden himself. We have this treasure and it has been hidden in earthen vessels. So we don't have to worry about what's going on on the outside because he gave us this definitive promise. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. When I understand that I'm already victorious, I don't have to be messed up about what's going on in this season. Seasons come, seasons go. People in the Bible had bad days. Naomi had a bad day. Naomi lost her husband. Then she turned around and her married sons, she lost both of them. The only thing she had left was her daughter-in-laws. And so Naomi had a really bad day. You lose your only capacity to leave a legacy on the earth. She had a bad day. Elijah had a bad day. Elijah had just come back from a successful venture in, in battle. Only to be handed a note that says Jezebel says she's going to kill you. Jezebel was notorious for killing prophets. She had a proven record. She, was, she had a track record of being successful in her quest to destroy prophets. Well, Elijah realized he was a prophet and she's killing prophets. So Elijah had a really bad day. So much so that Elijah took off running and said, I'm out of here. Because this sister here, she says she's going to kill somebody. She usually kills them. <laughs> Elijah had a bad day. Job, my God. Job had a really bad day. Oh my God, I still, I, my heart still bleeds for Job. Job had a bad day. Job had everything that you could ever ask. All of his dreams had been answered. He, he had, he had a, a prestigious name and prominence in the community. He was well thought of. He, he was a lover of God, a praiser. Job, Job had everything. He had a house. He had, he had wealth. He had a wife. I mean, Job had it going on. And all of a sudden, it seemed like the whole world was snatched out from under him. Job lost his wife. He lost his status. He lost his health. He lost, his, his wife turned on him rather, and he lost his friends, lost his children. Job lost everything. Job had a bad day. Job had a bad day. But let me say this. Nobody had as bad a day as Jesus. Good God in heaven. Every one of us has been exposed to a bad day. It's not something that we're oblivious to. We know what it is to have a bad day. Globally, we've experienced bad days. The day that Kennedy was assassinated, many people can recall where you were and what you were doing. And some people can tell you when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, exactly what was going on and where you were in the world. I remember where I was. I was getting on a plane when 9-11 happened. 
When the planes hit the towers, I was getting off a plane. Let me say it another way. It was a bad day. It was a bad day. Some of you had some personal bad days. Walk in the office and think everything is good, and they say, we're going to have to downsize. That's a good way to say, you're fired. It's just a soft way of saying it. We're going to have to relieve you of your responsibilities, and now you're stuck trying to figure out how in the world you're going to make ends meet. You've had some bad days. You had some so-called fake, fickle, phony friends who said they had your back, but they were really trying to stab you in your back. Come on, am I the only one who has some bad days? You've had some bad days. Perhaps it was that your child, you found out your daughter had gotten pregnant or was abused. Had some bad days or suddenly something just shifted in the atmosphere. Everybody in here probably has, can experience this dynamic and testify to the reality of it. Everybody has had a day when something else that you heard about happening in somebody else's life finally made it to your doorstep and left you saying, I never thought this would happen to me. Everybody has had a bad day. Jesus, however, had the worst of all. He had a bad day. He's sitting down having, can you imagine, you're sitting down having some wine and bread and fellowshipping and teaching and training with your, with your disciples, giving them instruction, letting them know that, hey, my time is almost at hand. Let me give you this, this wisdom before, let me, let me drop this wisdom and then drop the mic before I exit the room. Can you imagine that he's sitting there fellowshipping and all things seem to be well to the extent that the disciples, they really, they hear him, but they're not really receiving the message that he's giving them. They don't understand the dynamic before the, the, the crow, the, the, the cock crows three times. You're going to betray me. Oh, no, absolutely not. But he's sitting there in this, in this serene setting and all of a sudden, before you know it, a short course of time, he had to deal with betrayal, turned around and had to deal with false accusation. Then had to deal with rejection, abuse, and humiliation. Jesus had a bad day. Next time you say you have a bad day, I need you to think about the cross. Next time you, you get to the point where you want to lament and have a pity party and say, oh, woe is me. I'm having a bad day. I can't believe this is happening to me. I just need you to look at Calvary for a few minutes and realize what a bad day really looks like. Hebrews 12 and 2 says this, keep your eyes on Jesus. It says this for this fact, because we are to study his example. If you want to know how to be successful at navigating and overcoming a bad day, all you have to do is look at the example of Jesus Christ. Study how he did it. Please tell somebody else, it's going to be all right. How did Jesus navigate a bad day? How did he handle this situation? What did he do? He knew two things. He had, he had inside knowledge of the two things that are necessary in order for you to be able to manage, to handle, and to overcome your bad day. Number one, he knew that there was a purpose. And secondly, he knew there was an end. Every struggle that you have has a purpose. Everything that you're dealing with, it has a purpose. It catches you off guard. It makes you unnerved. You feel, you feel panicked and pressured and the anxiety and the stress can be overwhelming. But I need you to remember and remind yourself on a regular basis, there is a purpose for this. I used to wonder why my mother would always say, well, the Lord must be doing something. Well, what in the world is he doing? Because mama, I'm, I'm, I'm about to go crazy here. But every, what she knows is that everything that we go through has a purpose. Naomi lost her husband. She lost her sons. But what Naomi didn't understand was the, the orchestration of God who was, who was literally moving pieces as he was positioning the world for salvation. Naomi was being used by God but had no idea why she was being used and certainly would have chosen to be used in a different way. Any of us would testify that if we could do it a different way, Lord, you didn't have to give me the message like that. Just tweet me. <laughs> Send me a text message next time. I promise you I'll respond. But God in his infinite wisdom knows that you won't respond. Sometimes it takes the pressure and the pain of life, the moves, the shifts, because God is more concerned with how we, who we are than what we're enduring. He's not worried about what we're enduring because he's in charge. 
When I'm in charge, I don't have to worry about the dynamics of what's happening because I have authority over it. So all I'm concerned about is making sure that placement is accurate. Because if the placement is accurate, then I know the outcome will be what I have desired it to be. Are y'all with me? You can't get excited yet because you don't know that the outcome is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts, the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and the future. And when you know God's outcome is already set, then you don't have to worry about the process and the pieces. He might shift and move and reorganize organize and orchestrate. But at the end of it, his plan is that I have a hope, a future, and that I prosper. Say it to yourself this time. Don't worry about them. They don't, they don't want to listen to you. Say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> Worried about this thing. Naomi, she didn't understand what God was doing. God was moving pieces around so that his, his will could be manifested in the earth. Naomi, her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Naomi ended up being the catalyst to help unite Ruth with Boaz. When Ruth and Boaz made a divine covenant, they now become, they, they now become people in the bloodline of the savior of the entire world this would have never happened if the pieces hadn't been shifted by God and we would be standing here eons later walking in condemnation and sin if God had not allowed Naomi to go through what she went through you gotta understand Job went through what he went through but Job was a proving ground Job was to be a testimony for generations after himself. What you were dealing with is bigger than you. The stuff that you went through, it ain't even about you. You're talking about woe is me and why me and how did this happen to me? But what you don't understand, just like Job, God allows some things to go on and he allows you to go some, through some things because God has so much confidence in your ability to handle the pressure of your process. God was bragging on Job. He said, have you considered my servant Job? If there's anybody in here that I know I can have confidence that they're going to trust me and still love me and still praise me, Job is my man. Job is my guy. Job is the one that I can depend on because I know that even in the middle of the pressure, he's still going to believe that I am his God and never forget that I still got his back. Though he slay me. Job is going to say, yet will I trust him. So let me help you understand. All of the pressure and the pain and the problems and the trials and the sickness and the sorrow and all of the disappointment, disillusionment, all of the setbacks, the holdbacks, the, the fallbacks, everything that you've been through, it's because God looked over the balcony of heaven and looked at your character and said, if, if there's anybody I can trust that will still praise me, I know they're sitting in Victor Cathedral on this Sunday morning. The reason you went through it is because God has a plan oh, bless his name slap somebody until the weave shakes loose and say God trust me yeah he trusts me let me tell you how I know he trusts me because I've been through a whole lot he got a whole lot of confidence in me there are moments when I say Lord you, know, you shouldn't trust me so much but it's that he has confidence in my ability to withstand. Watch this. Job was a proving ground. Over 2,000 years later, we're still celebrating the life of Job. Not because of his pain, but because of his victory. Because of the triumph. We recognize that Job trusted God and God gave him double for his trouble. Jesus' suffering was not for nothing. It had a purpose. He went through what he went through so that all of humanity could experience forgiveness of their sins and could experience everlasting life. It was a reason for his suffering. 126 number of Psalm verses 5 and 6 says this. Those who sow in tears will reap in songs of joy. There's a purpose for what you're dealing with. I don't know who I'm encouraging right now. But whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, there's a purpose there is a purpose. God is orchestrating and moving things around to ensure that you have a great outcome. And we don't have to be concerned with it because Romans 8 and 28 says, and we know. And we know that all things 
How many things? All things work together for good, for the, for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. It's working for your good. And it's working in his purpose. There is a purpose for everything that he does. You should thank God that you lost that job. Because if you hadn't lost that job, you wouldn't know this job. If you hadn't left that job, you wouldn't know what God is about to set you up for as soon as you turn this next corner. You ought to thank God that some people walked out of your life. You ain't got to praise him. I'll praise him right there for myself. You ought to thank God because if they hadn't walked out of your life, you wouldn't realize that you weren't really living. You ought to thank God that some chapters ended in your life, that seasons turned in your life. You ought to thank God that he brought you out of some circumstances so he could put you in some greater. You didn't even realize the mess that you were in, but thanks be to God, he loved you enough that in spite of you, he still helped you. Some things that I needed to let go, I wouldn't have ever let them go if God hadn't helped me let them go. Come on here, somebody. There's a reason why your child got lured into trouble. What you don't understand is that you can't figure it out. Like, why is this my child? Why is my child going through this? But what you may not know is that your child might be the next prophet that God is going to use to speak life in the dead situations. Why is my child having to go through all of this sickness and all of this thing? What you might not know is that God might be setting your child up so that your child can be the one that can walk in a room, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover because he's authenticating their faith and creating their testimony hey. glory to your name God oh bless your name Jesus sometimes you don't realize that the person that's giving you the most trouble is also the most anointed I'm going to let that set in for a few minutes eyes have not seen ears have not heard hadn't even entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for you and the reason he can't show it to you is because you would mess it up but when you know who your God is you can go in the middle of a storm and still get a shout you can be in the middle of your pain and still find a praise you can be going through seasons of depression but you'll shake it off and say the devil is a lie it's gonna be all right I know who my God is and there's a reason for this there's a purpose in my pain and there's a promise for my victory I know it's gonna be all right and encourage yourself self there's a reason for this God I don't understand why you're doing it it hurts I'm confused I'm frustrated Lord I'm hurting I'm wounded God I'm weak Lord I don't know how I'm going to make it through this God you understand this is this is, this is really taking the wind out of me. It, it, my, my sail is coming down. My breath, my breath is leaving. I don't, I don't know how to press you. It's, it's, so, it's so heavy, Lord. I can't carry this. I, I don't know how I'm going to do it. He says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own. Here's the problem. You keep trying to figure out what God has already worked out. So if you spent your energy praising God for who he is, you would understand that he's already working out what you are dealing with. But we spend all of our energy worrying about how to fix it. Help me, Holy Ghost. Every struggle has a purpose. But then additionally, every struggle has an end. You've heard this in the Bible. It says it many times. And it came to pass. I have to say that to myself all the time. And it came to pass. Eventually, it's going to pass. 
eventually God's going to bring me out of it. At some point, he's going to bring me out of it. Remember that the Bible says in the scriptural text in verse 2 that Jesus was able to endure because he knew that what he was dealing with had a purpose. But additionally, he also in his infinite wisdom knew that it would also have an end. See, understand that God will either deliver you out of it or he'll give you grace to sustain you in it. But you still know that eventually it's going to come to an end. The 30th number of Psalm, the verse, verse 5 says this, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Hebrews 10, 36 and 37 says this, You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised for in just a little while. He who is coming will come and will not delay. When I saw that and I read that text, it says, for in just a little while, it took me back to my childhood. Because before they were, there were microwaves, you know, everything had to be heated in tin foil on the oven or in the stove. Anybody old enough to remember that? Yeah. Got some babies in here, so I had to make sure. I'm... Tin foil, what is that? That's what we call that silver stuff y'all call foil. That's a country, that's a down south way of saying it. Give me some of that tin foil. What is tin foil? My grandmother would get ready to warm us up something. And let me tell you, I've never seen anybody more creative to go in the kitchen with a little bit of nothing. But when she got done, you felt like, oh, my God. And so I remember sitting in the living room and she wouldn't let anybody come in her kitchen. She put everybody out the kitchen. Everybody get out my kitchen. Because when she was about to work, it was something magical. It was something, it was something dynamic. It, it was an anointing that would overtake her. It's like God got in those hands. And so she would go in there and she would work her masterpiece and she would be cooking. And you'd be in the living room. And so, you know, you started getting hungry. You started smelling it. Collard greens coming across the, the waves of the air and hitting you in your nostrils. Candied yams and sweet potato pies. And, and it just like, mmm. Y'all don't know nothing about this. This is real country. Hot water cornbread sizzling in the skillet. Y'all so country? I didn't know y'all had it in you. And so you would, you would be sitting there and, and your, your, your mind would say, be patient. But your stomach started saying, go ask, is it done? <laughs> and so I'd get up and go, we, we would draw straws as which one of us was going to go ask. Well, I would always volunteer to go first. Because I recognized that with each time we asked, you came closer and closer to the beating of your life. <laughs> so I'd be the first one, no, 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 y'all draw straws, I'll go first. Is it ready yet? Boy, go on back in there, sit down. Go on in there. It's almost, it, it, it'll be ready in a little while. So I said, all right, I'll go back in there. Y'all next. <laughs> Somebody else will go, is it, is it ready yet? Boy, I said go on back in there. Y'all go in there and play now. I told you it'll be ready in a little while. Somebody else will go. <laughs> you got to do it real cautiously because she would throw stuff. You never know what was going to come across the room. You, is it, is it ready? Boy, did I tell you to go back in there? And so whoever had that last straw, it was, pre it was predestined that they were going to sacrifice their bottom for the rest of us. <laughs> but after a little while, she kept saying, it'll be ready in a little while. It'll be ready in a little while. Then finally, she would set the table and she had all the utensils, everything that you needed in order to enjoy what she had prepared. She set it all out. It would be piping hot. You, you, know, you see the steam dancing off the top of it. Oh my God, you got ready. Then you would sit down and something mysterious would happen that when you sat down and you started eating, you would forget about the pain of the process of waiting on it to be done. 
You've never even thought about how, how much anxiety and how much stress you had and how anxious you were to get to the table. All of that time, you're like, oh my God, I'm starving. Oh, it can hurry up. But by the time you sat down and started tasting collard greens and black eyed peas and sweet potato, I would, I, I, by the time you started tasting all of that, you forgot about the pain of your process. And here's the catch. Everything that you needed to enjoy what she had prepared, she all already had it in place on the table you didn't even have to go and look for anything it was already there so here's the thing some of you are in the living room saying Lord is it over yet Lord is it time yet Lord have I gone through enough yet Lord is it time to bring me out he says sit down I'm preparing a table before you in the presence of your enemy and everything you're going to need to enjoy what I'm making will be there for you slap somebody high five and say it's gonna be all right in a little while in a little while how long is a little while just sit down in a little while you ain't even gonna worry about what you've been through you're not gonna smell like smoke you won't even look like what you've been through you what you've been through you'll forget how much it hurt you it's gonna be all right in a little while so help me jesus some things that you need to know and you need to keep in the forefront of your thinking because if you don't remember these things, the enemy will take advantage of your pain. Because pain makes you weak in your faith. You got to be careful. Pain is a tricky thing. Pain will, will make you forget about some things that are coming in your future. Pain will make you forget who your God is. Pain will cause you to, to curse your friends. Walk out on your family. Pain will cause you to make some foolish decisions that you live to one day wake up in a pig pen and regret. And process is painful. So you got to remind yourself of these things at all times. Number one, that God loves you. How can I endure what I'm going? Because I know God loves me. I know beyond a shadow. The old people used to say it like this. I know that I know that I know that I know that I know God loves me. Lamentations 3 and 21. He says, listen, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Because the Lord loves me, I'm able to keep going in spite of what I have to go through. The only reason I have a peace of mind or a peace of my mind left is because I know God loves me. If all I had to depend on was the love of other people, I would have fainted a long time ago. But because I know God loves me, it gives me strength to pick myself up and keep on going. People will love you when it's convenient for them. But God's love is unconditional and eternal. What happens in the pain of process is the enemy starts using process to try to make you think God doesn't really care about you. That God is not worthy. You start doubting that God really loves you. Why is he letting this happen to me? Why am I going through this? God must not love me. And like they say, he and I thought he loved me. Listen, there was a little girl who, uh, she was growing up and had gotten to the early adolescent years and her mother had a significant scar on her face. I mean, so much so that people would stop and stare. People would point and gawk and people would whisper and talk. And so she grew up all of her life with this dynamic. And eventually as she got older, she recognized that even some of her friends were having conversations about her mama's face and the disfigurement that she had on one side of her face, the scarring that she possessed. And so it, it ended up being a complex for the young girl to the extent that she, she then st she, she started being embarrassed of her own mother. They had a meeting at the school one day and they asked all the kids, tell your parents to be here for this meeting. Well, the little girl didn't tell her mother about the meeting. 
So when her mother ran into another parent, she said, where, where were you? We missed you at the meeting. Why didn't you come to me? She said, I didn't know anything about the meeting. Your daughter didn't tell you about the meeting? She said, no. So when she went home and she asked the little girl, hey, why didn't you tell me about the meeting with the parents at the school that it was supposed to be, I was supposed to be there? She said, I don't know. She said, no, no, you do know. Why didn't you tell me? Well, mama, I'm embarrassed. What you embarrassed about? Your face. People will talk about you and people are whispering and it's just embarrassing to me. She said, sit down. Let me tell you how I got this scar. She said, when you were a baby in your crib, you could barely crawl, you could barely, you, you could barely crawl and you could, you could very barely stand up. But a fire broke out in the house and you were in your room and all I could think about was I got to get to my baby's room so that she's not consumed by this fire. She said, I managed to crawl and make it to your room. And when I got you out of the crib, I shielded you and covered you. But on my way out of the house, a board that was full of flames fell down and it landed on my face. It landed on my face because I turned to make sure that you were covered by the fire, from the fire. She said, and I, we barely made it out in time for the medical technicians to see after us so that you could grow. I went through surgery after surgery after surgery, skin graft after skin graft. And I finally resolved within myself that whatever pain I have to endure, I got to get better because I have to make sure I can take care of my baby. She said, so the next time you feel embarrassed or ashamed about my face, I need you to remember how I got these scars. I got these scars trying to save your life. So the next time you look at God and get angry and frustrated about what you're going through, I need you to remember his scar. I got these scars trying to save. God bless your name, oh God. And you have the audacity. To doubt that I love you, I shielded you from sin. I shielded you from your unworthiness. I shielded you from unrighteousness so you could have everlasting life. Bless your name, Jesus. Oh, that's a minute right there. Let's just take 10 seconds because I'm about to go crazy right about now. I need this for myself if I can't get it for nobody else. Somebody give God what you know he deserves for the kind of love that he has given to us. Come on, we can do better than that. Everything that he went through, they beat him with a cat of nine tails. They ribboned his flesh. They marched him through the city. They spat on him. They pierced him in his side. They crowned him with thorns. The least we can do is show him we love him with a praise. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Woo. He loves me, he loves me. He loves me, he loves me. I don't ever have to question, he loves me. Second thing that you got to make sure you keep in mind, keep playing, Jason. If you don't, I'm going, to, I'm so excited about the love of God. That it's unconditional. I know that God wants the best for me. You got to keep telling yourself, God wants the best for me. He wants the best for me. He wouldn't do this to harm me. He saw, he told me. He wants the best for me. In Matthew 7, 11, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give your children good gifts, what makes you think your father in heaven, who is good, will not know how to give you good gifts? He wants the best for you. Sometimes pain causes you to, to, to really doubt that God's wisdom is God's wisdom. Just because in a crisis you don't know what's going on, it doesn't mean that God doesn't know what he's doing. 
He is an all wise God. And he wants nothing but the best for you. And then lastly, I need you to always remember. I know that in spite of whatever I'm going through, God will bring me through it. You got to tell yourself, he's going to bring me through this. It has purpose and it has an end. 2 Timothy 4 and 18, the Lord will rescue you from every evil attack. How many evil attacks? The Lord will rescue me from how many? I need you to say it till you feel it. One more time, come on. Every evil attack, God's going to rescue me from it. And he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How can I keep that in my mind? Because, Pastor, let me be real with you. I, I, I got it on Sundays, and when you're preaching it, I'm with you. But something happens on Monday. And I walk in the break room, and I feel like the devil got his foot on my neck. And I go back for my next doctor's appointment and my checkup. And I feel like I'm, I'm going to suffocate because if I have to go through another round of anything, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. How do I keep this in front of me? Two things. Two things that are going to help you remember this point that God's going to bring you through. It. Number one, memory. If you take a moment and just think about how he kept you the last time. If you remember how he kept you through this, then you're going to remember that he'll keep you through that. Always remember that he is a faithful and a consistent God. He continually has brought you through. You don't even realize you were on a hit list from the moment of conception. Can I tell you something that your mom and dad are never going to admit to you openly? Some of them may be gone on home and they, they're not even able to admit it. Some of you in this room, you don't understand that they contemplating, contemplated aborting you. But God had a purpose for you. And so the same seed of purpose in the minds of your mother and your father who ultimately did not come to the conclusion to release your life. But it was because God had a purpose for you. I knew it was going to get quiet in here right then. But it's a reality of life. We wrestle with this demonic spirit spirit that seeks to kill out and stamp out our potential and our purpose but God when he has a purpose will do what needs to be done in order to get the glory out of your life there is a purpose for you remember there's a purpose for you there's a purpose for your life and you got to always keep that in your memory second thing it's going to help you remember that God is going to bring you through it. Is you must have access to a testimony. Y'all remember back when we were younger and I remember my dad's church. They would have prayer meeting. Y'all know what prayer meeting is? Don't do nothing but pray. They would come together and pray until something happens. Well, my Pentecostals in here know about tarrying service. None but praying until something happens. But there was another dynamic that I really, I really recall. And it was called, before the prayer meeting would start, they have testimonial service. Y'all remember that? Giving honor to God who is the head of my life. To the pastor, deacons, trustees, stewards, walls, windows, and lights. I just want to tell y'all, I went to the doctor this last week. And the last time I went, they told me it didn't look good for them. But this time, they said they didn't find nothing. And the whole congregation would go bananas. And there would be one person that would keep shouting after everybody else stopped shouting. And what people didn't know is that that person had just gone to the doctor and was given the same bad prognosis. But because somebody, Mother Jenkins, got up.
and testified how God had healed her, they felt good that if you got the same God I got, then he can heal me too. Revelations 12 and 11 says this, we overcome the enemy by the power of the blood of the lamb and the what? Word of our testimony, the transparency of testimony gives you confidence that if the God that did it for you, did it for you, then guess what? He can do it for me too. If he did it before, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. Keep your memory. Don't forget. Because in the middle of pain, you start forgetting. People get real short memories. God, how are you going to do this? The same way I did it last time. Why am I going through this? Did you not get the purpose the last time? Aren't you glad that I moved him out your life? You would have never known your potential. Aren't you glad that you were shifted because now you've grown into such a phenomenal woman or man of God? But we forget short memories. Everybody stand all over the building. Grab the hand of somebody beside you right quick. Come on, grab their hand. You see these people, they're standing on the, in, on the outside. They look so dressed up and they look nice and they're smelling good, looking good. I hope they're smelling good. <laughs> Squeeze a hand one time. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is the hand of somebody that's had to go through seasons in life. They felt like throwing in the towel and giving up. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is the hand of somebody that's lost their job, their possessions, and their position. And they felt just like Job, like, what in the world am I going to do? Perhaps the hand that you're holding, they look good on the outside, but you don't know what they've dealt with on the inside. Squeeze it another time. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is attached to somebody that's had to deal with a prognosis or a diagnosis that didn't look good. Cancer, sickle cell, heart disease, all of the things that have attacked them on the inside, but they kept smiling. They kept on trying to, to keep their smile even through their tears. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is attached to somebody that's felt like throwing in the towel. They wanted to give up. They wanted to take their own lives. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is of a young person who has been through so much that they didn't want to live anymore. Perhaps the hand that you're holding has been confused and hurt and depressed and wounded. You never know it because they don't look like what they've been through. Squeeze it one more time. That's the last time. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is the hand of somebody that's had to stand at the graveside watching their loved one being lowered, feeling hopeless and helpless. Wondering how in the world they were going to make it through tomorrow. Perhaps the hand that you're holding is the hand of somebody that felt like this is it. It's over for me. Never going to be able to be who God has called me to be. Never coming out of this. Perhaps the hand that you're holding, 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 the hand that you're holding, the hand that you're holding, the hand that you are holding, the hand that you are holding, you're missing it, the hand that you're holding, that you are holding, the hand that's in your hand, that you are holding, the hand that you're holding. You want to know why I keep saying this? Why do you keep repeating the hand that you're holding? Because I need you to recognize that I wanted you to feel what a testimony feels like. But then secondly, I wanted you to realize that there's a hand that you're holding. In spite of everything that they have been through, they are here today with a hand for you to hold. If the devil had his way, they would have lost not just his hand, but they would have lost their life. But the reality is the devil is alive and they're still here. Now I need you to loose that hand and praise God because the same God that kept them is the same God that's going to keep you. The same God that brought them out is the same God that's going to bring you out. The same God that brought them through it is the same God. If you want to see a testimony, don't look too far, just look right here. If you want to see breakthrough, just look right here. If you want to see a miracle, just look right here. If you want to see the G-Y-A, it means give yourself away. And at Victory, it's more than just a slogan. 
It's who we are. We're living to be missed, not just remembered. And thanks to your generous support, we're changing the world one heart at a time. Find out more and give now at getthevictory.org slash GYA. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more information about what's happening in and around Victory, visit us online at smokynorfolk.com. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. Be blessed and keep walking in victory.